It was a bloodless hit carried out by federal agents heavily armed with arrest warrants. The FBI today busted the leaders of Detroit's mafia. It's the FBI's latest attack on organized crime in America's big cities. But despite the crackdown, the top FBI official says what he calls the Cosa Nostra remains, and I quote, the most significant organized crime threat in America. They were easily one of the most successful mafia families left in America until today. You're saying you guys are big players in the mafia. Is that true? Your father is. The Gamtax case was the first real chance for the federal government to dismantle the Detroit family like they had been doing to mob families all across the country during the late 80s and early 90s. The U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Eastern District of Michigan, I believe it was in March of 1996, brought down a, a multi-count indictment uh, on the majority of what was alleged to have been the hierarchy of the Detroit family of the Cosa Nostra. In coordinated raids, the FBI swooped up 17 members of the Detroit chapter of La Cosa Nostra, including all its top leaders. We're taking out the whole hierarchy, and that's what the significance of this particular investigation is. The nine of the, uh, the people arrested were, were made members, were the, the historical uh, leadership of this family for the past 30 years. In the case of Gamtax, we targeted the Detroit organized crime family, and we dealt with criminal activity dating back as, as far as the early, the mid-60s, all the way up to the date of the indictment, which was the mid-90s. The Detroit mob did it the old-fashioned way, the Justice Department said, by bombing some businesses into submission, extorting others, and even making a run at controlling the clubs in Las Vegas. The big break for the government came through the incompetence of two of the family soldiers, Novi Toko and Paul Carrado. Toko and Corrado, despite their infamous last names, were still working the streets, and in the mid-90s decided to organize their own numbers racket extortion ring. They decided that uh, they were going to generate some income collecting a tribute from bookmakers and numbers runners who were operating in the Detroit, organized, in the Detroit area. They were going to uh, take a monthly or bi-weekly payment from these guys in order to be allowed to run a, uh, a numbers business or run a bookmaking business. This is a street tax shakedown right, scam. Right. There were a lot of them that were Middle Eastern, and they went to them and they said, if you want to continue to function and continue to run your business, you've got to pay us for the opportunity to do that. But soon after they started shaking down mostly Middle Eastern bookmakers and numbers runners, their car was bugged, and Novi Toko and Paul Corrado talked themselves and the rest of the family straight into prison. They complained about the, uh, the hierarchy of the LCN not giving them a chance to make money, that they had theirs and they didn't care about the little guys who were trying to make their way. They, at one point in time, they were having difficulty collecting from a particular uh, bookmaker, so they discussed either setting off a bomb in, his, uh, in the parking lot of his business on Michigan Avenue. They ultimately decided to shoot a gun through his window. Now, uh, Tony's really once again got in trouble uh, in the 1990s, along with the whole family in the GAM tax bus, but what was specifically disturbing to Jack Toko and the rest of the administration was that Tony Zarelli was actually caught on tape, on surveillance, uh, audio surveillance coming out of cars uh, being driven by his nephew, uh, Nove Toko, and uh, cousin Polly Corrado. Jack is someone who is notoriously uh, uh, very uh, hard to get on audio surveillance, and someone who's probably only been picked up by the FBI audio surveillance people uh, less than a dozen times in his whole career. Uh, Tony really has not been so lucky and has been caught on tape several times, including the Gamtax bus. Oh, I, I think the, the fact that Novi is his nephew, that he approved Novi's activities, that he authorized what Novi did and that he himself was ultimately caught on tape discussing with Novi taking action against the civilian, not a person in any way directly involved in the LCN, all caused people to say, but for Novi Toko and, and his, his uncle Anthony Zarelli, we might not be here in this particular case and on the indictment. Jack Toko later blamed Zarelli in large part for the Gamtax convictions, and Zarelli's criminal career came to a dead end after 50 plus years as a made man. Uh, as I said before, Zarelli did a jail term, and when he came out last April, he's been persona non grata with the Detroit Mafia. Rumor on the street is that Jack Toko was so upset with him for his behavior, he's taken his stripes away, knocked him down from underboss, and put him on the shelf. Tony Zarelli's been walking around town kind of. Uh, 
not in the best of light, looking for money. Uh, Jack Togo apparently won't take his calls, and uh, Tony's really is not really at the point that I think he thought he'd be sitting here in his 80s now. And it really kind of tells the story of two first cousins in Jack Toko and Tony Zerilli and kind of the past that they both took. Uh, and as we are today, Tony Zerilli is really not in the fold anymore. Jack Toko is still on top. It really tells the whole story. Boss Jack Toko, his brother Tony, along with Anthony the Bull Corrado, Big Polly Corrado, and Novi Toko all went to trial in 1998. With the exception of reputed consigliere Tony Toko, who was believed to have taken over as acting boss when his older brother Jack was sentenced to time in prison, all the main targets of the Gam Tax prosecution were convicted. But, but each one of the three counts on which Jack Toko was convicted, uh, two RICO counts and a conspiracy to commit extortion, each carried a 20-year uh, maximum sentence. Jack Toko had been found guilty by the jury of being the head of the Detroit La Cosa Nostra family and directing and allowing his subordinates to carry out various criminal activities dating back into the 1960s. The trial judge in the case of, uh, of Jack Toko elected to give him one year and one day in prison. Toko's lenient sentence shocked the government. Federal prosecutors appealed the sentence two different times with little result, and Toko ultimately served less than three years in prison. All the other defendants who were convicted, Novi Toko, Paul Corrado, and, and Dominic Corrado, and ultimately Tony Zerilli, all received much more significant sentences than that. Novi was able to get an early release because he agreed to cooperate with the government, but Jack Toko got a, a relatively a uh, minor sentence, much less than would be suggested by a person whom the jury determined to be the head of the family and the person responsible for all the activities committed by all the other people. But John Corbett O'Meara, U.S. District Court Judge, elected to give him the sentence. Uh, Jack Coco can never go around anymore and claim to be a businessman. He's a convicted racketeer and a convicted extortionist, and that's going to follow him forever. And he can never deny that, and he can never hold himself out again as a pillar of the community, in my judgment. Well, Jack Toko was convicted in 1998 as being the boss of the Detroit family of La Cosa Nostra. I, I believe they referred to it as the combination. Uh, Jack Toko um, in, came out in trial. He relayed messages through his underlings, Capos, to carry out uh, the business that they needed to carry out. 